In today's edition of the Your Law Firm Success podcast, I talked to Ruth Croman, who's the managing partner at McNabs in Perth in Scotland. One of the reasons I wanted to chat to her was because she's performing a role which I think is can be quite common and quite challenging within small to medium sized law firms, which is that of the hybrid technician, lawyer and managing partner. In this episode, she talks about the transition from lawyer into management. In this episode, she talks about the transition from lawyer into management. She talks about succession planning and she talks about attracting and retaining female talent. And given the fact that we have many more women than men now entering the profession, this is something well worth listening to. Ruth, thanks for coming in this morning. Thanks for traveling down. Where have you come from? You're just outside Dollar. Okay, so where's that for those who are... Uh, for those that are not familiar with the geography of central Scotland, so yes. about an hour away, kind of sits between Stirling and Kinross. Right, okay, so an hour away from Glasgow. Yeah, and I've had my initiation around the east end of Glasgow this morning as well. Well, it's a pleasant <laughs> place to be. <laughs> on, on, a, on a Thursday morning, yeah. all, all is well with the world. <laughs> Good, and um, so could, you know, I obviously know you and we've worked with you for quite a while, yeah. worked with yeah. McNabs. Could you tell me a bit about you, your role now, how you've got there and a bit about McNabs in general, please. Yeah, sure. So um, I am 49, just about to be next week. Um, have been a lawyer very conventionally, went to uni straight out of straight out of school, um, did my law degree, did my diploma, did my traineeship um, and um, then have worked in litigation um, and laterally in family law in the Perth Street area all, all that time. Um, I'm now the managing partner at McNabs. McNabs is a, I suppose, a personal services legal firm um, based in Perth, but we have offices in Pitlochry, um, Bridge of Allen um, and Blair Gowrie as well. And we, I think there are 44 of us um, at the present count. And I do a hybrid of the managing partner role um, and trying to drive the firm forward but also I have still a foot in fear earning as well so I have this kind of hybrid role just now. And why was that that when you decided to make the move into management but not completely? Yeah I think just the, the size of firm so I became managing partner in, in 2017 and we had never had a managing partner up until that point um, and I think the, the firm had been through various various changes, various changes of personnel at partner level as well. And there was a recognition then that actually we, we needed to, you know, get our stuff together and, and just get, if, if we were serious about trying to do things differently, I suppose, then we needed to have a bit more of a cohesive approach um, and have someone that was focused on, on driving that forward. Um, and at that time, I think they were five partners that we had or four partners I think um, and it seemed to fall on to me that everyone thought that it would be a good idea if I did this as well um, and I suppose the last six years really have just been an evolution of what that role looks like for for us as a firm you know we're certainly a still a really small firm we're still a personal legal services firm I don't think there is a, an economic justification a commercial justification for having a full-time managing partner mm. um, and so because it was a new role for our firm as well um, it's been great because it's allowed me to to shape it as to how I think um, it should be done but that has you know that has meant having a foot in both camps effectively, having that managerial oversight, but still being in court, you know, on the ground, speaking to clients on a daily basis. Yeah. See, that's, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, you say you're, a, you're, you know, still a small firm. You know, the vast majority of firms in the UK are, you know, one to four partners. I think there's something yeah. like 85% of them. Um, this podcast is directed and designed for those in small to medium sized law firms understanding how they can make their law firm more successful and one of the challenges that they are always going to have um, is making that decision as to when you move yep. from becoming a technician yep. into management and just to, to cover that phrase a wee bit more we were talking about it before we started recording around the, the e-myth by Daniel Gerber, which is a very, very good book. And it talks about, at the outset, how one will typically start a business because one is 
good at something or as a technician, um, whether that be a baker, a hairdresser yep, or sure. a lawyer, then once you start to run your own business, you require to take on three different roles, which is that of the technician, that of the manager and that of the um, entrepreneur until you get to the point where you are able to take on people to perform those roles. But in McNabs, you'd never had a managing partner. That's right. What was the the genesis for that change or for you to decide, no, this is something that we need? Yeah, I think around that, so it was 2017, as I said, that I became the managing partner. And I think around that time, there was quite a lot of movement in the Scottish legal market. You know, we saw, for example, I can't remember the precise dates, but, you know, Dundas and Wilson, which had always been a big, big firm, um, they were no longer, we saw, we'd seen McLean, Murray and Spence, um, no longer exist. Todd's money names that you know. If you're my, if you're my age, you would be very familiar I'm with exactly as a the lawyer. Same age. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Um, and so I think we had then seen quite a lot of merger activity in smaller firms. You know, whether for lack of succession planning or whatever, in the Perth area, but also more widely across Scotland, um, having to lose their identity and you know go and be part of a bigger firm. Um, and we thought, right, okay, well, we need to think about this. You know, do we want to, what's our strategy? Is it we want to build ourselves up so that we are an attractive target for someone, to a bigger firm to come and look? Is that what the momentum in the Scottish legal market is looking like? Um, you know, we need to, we spoke to a couple of consultants just really recognising, as actually as you're saying, Stephen, as well, with the, the e-myth that, you know, we're lawyers, we're technical lawyers, we, you know, we need to work out. We have a business as well, though, and we need to work out what's going to be best for, for our business and our staff and the collective um, and started really exploring what it meant to be a law firm, I suppose, as well, and where we wanted to go, um, just piquing our interest, I suppose, beyond the technical Mm-hmm. the technical law that we that we do. And what did you decide in terms of where you wanted to go? Yep. I mean, obviously this, this is a podcast about law firm success. Sure. You know, we talk to a lot or we talk a lot to our um, client firms around desired future state. Yep. You know, what was the discussion around that? Yeah, I think we, we thought we don't want to be um, one of these firms who just remain static. And, you know, if you stand still, you're going backwards. Um, and th- therefore, that there is no, th- we leave ourselves in a position that there is no alternative. But to become part of a larger organisation, you know, you've lost all your leverage. <clears throat> you know, you're just, you're there to be subsumed. And we thought, right, we, we know we don't want that. That, that. that didn't fit with any of our individual purposes or drive, I suppose. Um, and so we thought, right, well, we have to do something. And as I say, we spoke to, to a couple of consultants um, just about what the Scottish legal market looked like, what their feel was with, you know, where the, the direction of travel was, I suppose, and thought, right, okay. And we, we had a bit of a collective decision, right, we'll give this, a, you know, let's try and get our shit together and let's give, you know, a, 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 this as good a go as we, as we can. And let's really try because I think up until that point, our firm had been on the go for you know more than 120 years. It existed for a long time, but it was more a collection of technicians, I would say, that happened to work under the same branding, almost like an advocate stable. Yeah. Um. You know, with with our headed notepaper or whatever, and pulling you know cashier and reception services, rather than actually exploring what our purpose was, why are we doing this, what makes us good at our jobs um, and and we've spent the last six years I suppose thus far and will continue to do so um, working out what motivates us what makes us a bit different from from other firms um, and and why that is hopefully attractive to our, to our clients and to, to staff who want to come and work for us and what would your assessment be of that now in looking retrospect, backward, yeah, yeah, looking backwards, uh, we, we always this is slightly cheesy, but we always talk about our McNabsness. Right. Um, so it's like slightly quirky, yeah. slightly different. Um, we have the, the firm has grown quite substantially over the last ten years. Um, anyway, both in terms of revenue, but also staff and and geographically um, as well. Um, but it's just doing things a bit differently and always remembering that we're a personal legal services firm and 
our job is always about people whether and, and, and personal relationships, whether that's with your staff, whether that's with your clients, whether that's with your third party suppliers and making sure that's front and centre of, of everything that we do. And so it sounds as if that maybe part of that has been um, working on establishing your brand values. Yes. And I know you work with Julie. Yes. Like Pelo, um, Pelo, is it? Pelo. 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 And um, that's very helpful in terms of understanding the way that you talk to one another, that you talk to your your clients, the way in which your staff yep. understand. Yep. Um, and that that can remove a lot of the uncertainty around that type of thing. And, and was that easy to bring? We're all partners. Uh, there, there are, you know, there are always going to be some people who who get it, or and who are more engaged in and and are interested in that part of the business. There are some um, staff, I would say, not all not restricted to partners who are more interested in just being the technical experts yes. and just yes, being, yes, being yes. a technician and that and that's absolutely fine. It's always been something that has interested me, sort of, you know, that I haven't heard of the e-myth, but it sounds like I can resonate completely with, with, with what you've told me about it. But I've always been someone who's quite interested in other, you know, management books or some of the business psychology books, um, you know, even things like getting to yes and, you know, the negotiation tactics. It just interests me. Um, and I think from from our perspective, um, every, everyone was interested in making the business as successful as it could be. And we thought, you know, what's to be, ven- nothing ventured, nothing gained. Let's let's go and give it a go and, and see what we can do. And from a personal perspective, did you put your hand up or were you pushed forward? I think I was nominated. Right. And how have you found that yeah. transition? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, it's not it's not static. It, it evolves. You know, some weeks are much more management heavy some do, than 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 others. Some weeks are you know completely absorbed. If I've got a big a big divorce case coming up, then I'm completely absorbed in in that particular case. Um, I think one of the massive challenges is jumping from different roles and putting your different hat on um, from there. But where I think I'm fortunate because I've been at McNabs for. 21 years now to absolutely terrifyingly um, and I've seen and the business has changed so much in in that time but it feels like a bit of a natural evolution so because I've been there so long and worked with the same colleagues for you know for the large majority for so long as well it feels like we've all kind of got that transition together I suppose and it sounds as if which I think can get lost in terms of the overall all pursuit of um, wealth mm-hmm. that it sounds like you've got a, a family within the business as well it's probably dysfunctional there's probably uh, some siblings that you like more than others however it sounds like a place of comfort yeah. for you and I don't mean that in a sort of um, comfort as in not wanting to push your boundaries or anything like that but just yeah. somewhere that I, feels I, like home yeah I think that that's that's absolutely right because I've been there so long and because the changes that we ha- that the business has been through have been largely not exclusively but largely because we've driven those changes as well rather than having them imposed um externally as well it, it, it is I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable there because I know yeah I know the business I know how it works I know our challenges I know our strengths but I absolutely know our weaknesses um as well and just having had the opportunity to to live that I suppose and evolve with the business it's a privilege yeah and we've we've had staff that have worked with us I mean so we have we have some staff that I have worked with not necessarily at McNabs but since I was 16 and doing work experience before I went to uni right okay um so there are a lot of long-standing relationships there as well well I mean I think for those who don't know you know the type of area in which you operate geographically is a relatively affluent part of Scotland with a lot of um nice towns and villages Nice place to live, it I is. imagine, and a nice place to spend your time. But the the movement, so the movement into you're you're, you're operating a, a hybrid role. At what point do you think that becomes impossible? Yeah, I think it, it, it's a it's a good question and one that I have yeah posed to myself and had posed to me. I have to say, lots of times over the, the over the last um, three four years. Um, I think 
I, I, I quite often, so I, I work with a, a coach um, and he quite often says to me, right, okay, well, which one do you prefer, Ruth? Do you know, do you like the management? Do you like the fear? And, and I can't decide. And it's sometimes, you know, it will oscillate from week to week, you know, but I, I fundamentally, I like I like being involved in the fear and work to some extent. I like the client relationships. I enjoy seeing someone who comes to see me pretty much broken after they've separated or had a you know a significant life event, um, and then working with them to get to the point where you know they can see a way forward, and, we, we, and you know we've helped them from, from that perspective, and that's why I started doing family law and so part of me is really reluctant to step away from that and to say right okay I'll just do the management and I actually think I hope that it makes me a better managing partner because I still have so much client contact and I can understand what the challenges are both for our staff and dealing with with clients as well but for our clients um, ourselves so sorry I'm not sure I've answered that question. Well, I think <laughs> it's it's, it's a really difficult one, I think, for the managing partner within law firms because unlike other businesses where the manager is um, is brought in because of their managerial skills, whether it might be a director of operations sure. or a COO or wh whatever it might be within the, within the legal sector, which is quite, you know, you move from being a technician into a managing partner. Now, if you make that full-time move, it's difficult to move back. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and the tenure only lasts so long. Yeah, so. yeah. So I mean, we, because this was a, a new role, we don't have, and we're, because we're a relatively small firm, you know, we don't have the rolling three-year appointment, for example, that you see some of the bigger firms having in a, in a formal election. Um, and, and nobody's challenged me for the, for the role yet. I mean, sometimes I would, some weeks I would gladly be passing the mantle on mm. um, when there's particular challenges. Um but I mean, I, I I don't know that you would ever, or maybe there will come a time when I think, right, okay, do you know what? I, I, I've, we've built the department up that I'm involved in as a fee earner sufficiently that there is enough depth of an experience as well as bodies that, that I, I can take a step back. But I think I would only want to do that if I wanted to do it um, yeah. as well, because I, I do think it still having some involvement, as I say, in, in client work. It's a good thing, I think. See, it's funny that you say that because, you know, I, I, over the course of the past year, it's been very um, illuminating for me and that I've understood as a result of bringing in people with significant agency experience that actually I have at points performed the role of the entrepreneur and the manager and actually I'm a terrible manager. Um, I, I, I couldn't possibly comment, but <laughs> I, could, I can understand why... And that's probably the same for, for me as well, just of necessity. But what we have tried to do is, you know, recognise what your strengths are. Yeah. Recognise what your weaknesses are. And yeah. that's probably more important. Yeah. And so, you know, we have brought in um, IT outsource, marketing outsource, yeah. um, HR outsource. We have, I have a, a coach and part of a peer-to-peer -peer business leaders group. Um, but we've extended that to all our partners as well in terms of coaching, not from a lawyer, mm -hmm. but from um, a bit business development, not in terms of expanding your business, but just more your how to be an entrepreneur, yeah. how to run a business and trying to help bridge that gap between technician and, and, and moving on to being a partner in a law firm and therefore an entrepreneur um, in some role as well. Um, and, and just trying to recognise what we don't know mm -hmm. and not getting stuck with the ego, which I think sometimes you see in law firms um, of I'm, re I'm a really good lawyer, mm. so I must be a really good partner and yeah. I'll be a really good manager. Yeah. And we all know that that's not always the case. Yeah, I think well, I've, I've been, you know, it can be easy to confuse how much money you're making with how clever you are. Yep. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> More senior partners. So as you were moving in to the managing partner role, I imagine there was more senior partners there at that time. Yes, there were. They were probably getting used to this idea that suddenly Ruth, who'd been there forever, was now in charge. How was that? And are they still there? Um, 
Yeah, yes. So I think there were two partners who were more senior to me at that point. Um, both of them were hugely supportive of me taking on this role. Neither one of them would have wanted to do it. And I think that I'm really fortunate that, that, that I've had that support as well. One has now retired. One is about to take a step back uh, and retire uh, in a couple of months time. So that is a, a transition for me as well in terms of these are people that I have worked with for a long time. Um, but you know, I've had nothing but support um, from, from my fellow partners since I since I took on that role. And how have so you, far, anyway. Well, I'm sure, I mean, it, <laughs> it sounded at the time as if it was a very collaborative collegiate process that you were involved in, where it was a recognition, we need somebody to be taking this role and we need the best person yeah, in the business to do that. Absolutely. It, it was by no stretch of the imagination any kind of power grab or, you know, yeah. and we have never been a partnership, thankfully, I'll touch wood, um, where people's elbows are out or there's particularly jostling for position. Yeah. And, you know, and I think, you know, when I hear horror stories from other places, I think, gosh, we're really, really, really fortunate um, in that. And we talked um, before before this discussion around those partners moving on. Yep. And managing the succession planning process within your business. Yeah. Are you able to talk a wee bit about that? Because I'm sure that's also something that is shared, is a shared concern of many law firm partners all across the country. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it's something that, you know, we had seen and continue to see, I suppose, in our, in our geographical area, but I'm sure all over Scotland as well, that people don't start thinking about right. Well, what's my what's my exit strategy? What's next for me? Um, until it's it's almost too late to doing it. Recognizing that these things can't happen overnight, or even in a you know even within a year period. Um, so I mean, in the last year, we've I've had quite a lot of change. And as as I mentioned, one of our, our senior partner, in fact. Um, Stuart is taking a step back from the end of February. He has been, that's been a very managed situation over three, four years where he's become part time um, and taken, taken, you know, that, that step back to help him, I suppose, as well, as well as the business manage that transition. Um, we've recruited another partner um, who's somebody that worked with us years ago um, to come back. And, and she's been in situ alongside Stuart for um, nearly two years now. Um, and we've expanded at a more junior level so that we can hopefully create the right shape of the department, um, but trying not to lose the, the breadth of knowledge, I suppose, um, that we had. I also had one of my more junior partners who I'd worked with for 15 years um, left the firm um, to go and sit as a summary sheriff, um, which all happened within a relatively short period of time. So I found myself... Just re reflecting, I suppose, that these two partners who I had always had a great working relationship with, still do have a, a great relationship with, um, were going to going to be not sitting around our partnership table. And, and how did that make me feel? You know, and just pausing and reflecting um, on that. Um, we had already brought on two other partners um maybe two years previously, always, I think, recognising that I think one of our strengths as a firm has been having quite a junior partnership, not having lots of people in their 60s um, sitting around the table um, expecting that, you know, their capital account's going to be paid out and everyone else is there solely for that purpose um, and trying to create, I suppose, a dynamic partnership where everybody recognised the entrepreneurial role that they had to play as well. Um, so we're now in a situation that once Stuart um, retires next month, um, that we have, we will have five partners. I'll be the oldest, you know, I think we have one, one partner who will be in his, in his early 40s and the rest are all in their 30s. And so it sounds like you've managed this, the succession part. What? Are you able to summarise what you think would be the key element or the key elements around succession planning in a relatively small firm? I think encouraging honesty with everybody around the table about what their own personal objectives are and what their own personal plans are um, and trying to scope out a, a plan 
really in, in, in very general terms, whether that's, you know, over the next year, over the next two years, over the next five years um, as well. Always be looking out, I think, for people's whose values align with with what what yours are and what the firms are. Um, I think just, yeah, always thinking about the bigger picture because mm-hmm. I think anyone who has worked as a partner in a law firm knows, you know, things will come from left field on that idle Tuesday afternoon and completely throw you. And so you need to be able to pivot and adapt and think, right, okay, that, okay, that wasn't part of the plan for this week but or this month or this year, but right, what are we going to do? And then just being able to to pause and reflect, um, thinking about where both who whom might be a good fit for you if you're going to look externally, looking within the firm already as to who could be supported to grow, to get in. They might not be, they might be a pure technician just now, but who could you support to grow to get into that role? Mm. Um or, or alternatively, looking for for other firms potentially, I suppose, or to to, to merge with to try and create a new business um, entity as well. And you know that, that we're always looking for how does our business evolve, and not being and yeah, not having our minds closed as to how that might be. I suppose. And talking about the future, one of the things that I've heard you talk about is around attracting and retain, retaining female talent in particular, yeah. given the fact that we now have more women than men entering the legal profession. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, and I noticed from your partnership that, and it looks a bit swinging there, you know, there are, which is, you know, great to see. The, I mean, I, I'm always of the view, a person's a person. Yeah. You know, and you want to recruit the right person. However, Typically, um, women or traditionally have had sort of different requirements around work. Yeah. Because biologically, they're the ones who end up, you know, uh, pregnant or in raising a fa- you know, having to raise a family initially. Yep. So how is it that you're working on that or what's important to you around all of that? I think it's, it's one of these things which when I was in my 20s, I would say, um, and looking around... Who else was involved? Who were my role models? Who were, you know, my mentors? And certainly in the the Teesside area at that time, there were very few female partners. There were certainly very few equity female partners. Um, And I don't think I can think of any, anyone that was a managing female partner or or held that role. Um, Now, in fairness, that was, you know, 20 20 years ago as well. Um, But I just thought, hmm, that didn't, it didn't feel like there was, necessarily anything that to, to, to aspire to from that p- perspective. Like there was a glass ceiling? Yeah, there? yeah. I, 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 and I've been very fortunate and, and I'm, I, I'm very conscious that, and as I said, my partners have without fail always been um, supportive of me and my role and ultimately recognised, I think, that we, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll work hard. Um, that might mean that I need to go to sports day that might mean I've got you know I've got two kids that I'll need to go and leave at quarter to five to pick them up from from nursery. I'll work part time where it needs to be, and the, the partnership's view has always been: do what you need to do. You know, we'll we'll bear with you. And I, but I know that's a very privileged position, and that is absolutely not the position that a lot of my friends from uni, my contemporaries um, have had as well. I hope it is getting better. I think it is getting better, particularly in bigger firms and bigger firms who are able to offer, you know, for example, longer periods of paternity leave or parental leave. Um, You know, some big firms I think are offering a year's um, parental leave irrespective of whether it's, you know, mother or father, which which is great to see. Um, But I think recognising that you know, you're saying absolutely more entrance into the legal profession are female. But if you look up towards the the, the top level, you know, who, who's an equity partner, who's a managing partner, um, the statistics are still pretty appalling. Um, there's a recent time study um, that, that that talks about, I think it's something like 20 odd percent of around a board table are, are female. Now, that's part of that, I think, is absolutely in 
is because, as you're talking about, the women have traditionally had more caring responsibilities um, as well. And the employers have not been as flexible, perhaps, as they are now. Mm. I ho- really hope that in 10 years' time, a bit of the lag from that has, has dissipated and it, it's not, the statistics are not quite as stark. Um, I, I mean, in fairness, I, I'm not here to say women are hard done by. Um, but I think just recognising as well that women are sometimes um, don't put themselves forward for these roles, right. that firms don't create the environment which allows women to think that they can put themselves forward without selling their soul. Um, yeah. Well, in terms of selling their soul, in terms of the time that's required? or Yeah, the, the time and the commitment, I suppose. Not, not and, and that's not... D- not just in terms of fee earning work or supervising work or whatever that you're doing, um, as a in in that managerial role, but also in terms of what the business development expectations are. So a lot of the big firms, for example, I know well the expectation is that you're going to record however many business development hours, and you know things are slightly better, perhaps I'm not sure they're massively better, but a lot of those business development business development opportunities are, you know. Monday to Friday, you know, straight after work. And if you've got ke- young kids to pick up from nursery or whatever, then, you know, th- that that is a challenge. Um, so it's, it's just trying to start a bit of a conversation and a bit of a, an awareness, I suppose. I mean, it definitely is, a, you know, an interesting conversation to have and um, important that it's raised because every business wants to attract the best talent, Absolutely. The best possible talent. And if as a result of failing to think about the ways in which you can accommodate uh, women and their progression within the workplace means that you're then not able to get that talent, well, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. You know, and, and, and like you discussed, one of the reasons that I st- stopped being a lawyer very quickly was because I wasn't interested in the lack of flexibility. Yep. It didn't mean I didn't want to work hard. Absolutely. You know, and it's the same, you know, and it's the, it's the same when you have family commitments which require you to be there, for, which is the most important thing, you know, o- over the piece with your family because you can't get that time back. Yeah. But that does not mean that you don't want to progress. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, there's... I've become part of a group called Look Up and Beyond, with um, who's, which is started by a lady called Naima Sajid, who operates a business called Diversity Plus. And Naima um, has created this group of people, women, who are in the legal profession from lots of different, um, from private practice, from, you know, in, in-house, um, uh, practising, non-practising, but who have an interest in okay, this is where we are just now, but but how can we make it better for, for the 20-year-old self, you know, 20 years ago? Um, you know, what are the challenges that we still see that need to be to be called out and looked at? So, you know, if your firm's, you know, staff, you know, hangout time is, right, we go for drinks on a Friday night, you know, at five o'clock, okay, that's going to work for some people, but it's not going to work for everybody. And it's about just pausing and Lunch reflecting. Lunchtime pints. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, 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 you know, or if it's right, yeah. okay, we'll, we'll have a five, we'll have a five, a five a side tournament. Yeah. And that's, that's what we do, you yeah. know, but actually, yeah, yeah. right, okay, traditional, not to yeah. say that yeah, yeah. some women are going to do that, but just pause and think about it and think about, I suppose, how, um, how you're flexible, you know, lots of firms will say, oh, yeah, yeah, we operate flexible working policy. I mean, you're obliged to work it, you know, mm. to be considered flexible working requests. But what do they actually mean? And I think, I hope, um, because I have been fortunate to work hard, but, you know, have that flexibility um, in the environment that we've created at McNabs, I, you know, I, we have lots of staff who work flexibly, who work, you know, compressed hours or who work non-standard hours, who will do some at home at night because they need to pick children up from nursery. And, you know, some, that comes with its challenges as well. It's not to say that's all, you know, all rosy all the time. It, inevitably, there are challenges. But I know that I really appreciated that flexibility. Um, and it's it's not forever. It's for, yeah. it's, it's for a window in time. Yeah. But I think, and I hope that, you know, that flexibility being afforded 
lets people continue in their careers that they might otherwise just think, do you know what, this is all too hard, it's all too much of a challenge, my family life's suffering. You know, no, nobody can have it all. There are always compromises to be had, but I think, you know, working flexibly. I, I hate the idea of a work-life balance because to me that's almost like the scales of justice and they've got to sit, you know, entirely um, parallel with each other. Sometimes work's going to steal more of your time, but some, as long as life sometimes steals a bit back of your work time, um, then in the round is what we, what we try and aspire to. Yeah, I think it's because it can be a bit like, having two jobs undoubtedly and I think trying to build there's there, there are various phases we mentioned that earlier we're at a similar age I imagine as I did when you're starting off in your career mm -hmm. you work harder yep because you're trying to establish yourself you're learning you're trying to build a career and then as that progresses and you begin to build up some momentum, then it's not that you take your foot off the gas, but that you're able to understand how to balance things yeah. a bit better. Um, but I think that takes time. Uh, and experience yeah. as well. And also that life experience, I think, to be able to then take a step, a step back and look at the bigger picture. You know, because we, we see it with, you know, our NQs and more junior um, fee earning staff as well do, 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 you know th their focus is all on what their fees are this month and you know just very much focused on being the technician yeah. as well and it's only at but we're you know we're trying to work with them to encourage them to to you know to take a step back and to look at right okay well did you provide an excellent service to that client? It's not just, do you know the law? And yeah. I wrote a killer letter that put the other side back in their place. That's not just what the job's about as well. Um and, and trying to Encourage them, I suppose, to have that introspection as well, and move and recognise beyond beyond the technician yeah. as to you know yeah how it how it all actually works. And the um, finally on that point, what do you think are the key elements of attracting and retaining female talent? Um, I, I mean, flexibility has got to be the key. I think recognising that people, the challenges that people have, um, whether that's um, a caring responsibility for children, for parents, you know, for, for a family member, one size does not fit all, that we're all here to live, that the work's important, <coughs> that the business is important because it provides a livelihood for, for 44 of us, um, but, but it's not the be all and end all. And I think showing that you care, um, showing that you understand there will be things that you know, that, that come along and will throw a spanner in the works, um, but that you can, nine times out of ten, find a solution if you talk about it and think through what the challenges are and work flexibly. Um, not being closed, I suppose, in yeah. your thinking, I would say, would be the, the, the biggest challenge in terms of whether that's what kind of work, um, when the work is done, how that's communicated to clients, you know, just, I suppose, trying to have that collaborative ethos of... Like we'll find a solution to this. It goes back to being honest as well as you're talking yeah, about your discussions. Totally. totally. And, 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 you know, and I think honesty and, and authenticity um, mm. as well, because everybody that works in the firm sees me, you know, living that, yeah. I suppose, that you know, yeah. quite often I'm like, oh, sorry, I'm actually running out to pick up my kids just now. So yeah. there's a half hour window on a Tuesday afternoon that I can't yeah. don't yeah. put anything in my diary. Um, and that that's fine. And yeah. I, I think people see that, you know, I hope... We see that I'm still doing a good job, that I'm there for my clients, I'm there for, you know, if there's any problems. It doesn't need to be the Monday to Friday, nine yeah. to five, sell your soul. Yeah. You can you can still do your job and on your terms, I yeah. suppose. And uh, finally, law firm success. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, a law firm is a living and breathing and dynamic thing, or it should be, in my, in my view as well. And I think a successful law firm for me and law firm success is one which has a direction of travel, one which evolves, one which one which is, you know, attractive to clients, one is which is attractive to um, the employees that are already there as well as new clients as well um, 
yeah, f- financial success as well. Don't don't get me wrong. I mean, we're all we're all here because we've got mortgages to pay and you know and people to support. Um, but a law firm success is something that I think. Yeah, it's a bit of an intangible, I would say, because as you say, you know, everyone has an objective measure as to what that might be, and it's, you know, whether you have, you know, your income of half a million a year or or whatever like that. But but for me, it's more about a, a successful law firm is one which has a dynamism and and uh, a, a clear trajectory forward. And do you feel that as a result of your changes that you've made over the course of the past few years at McNabb's that Pre two thousand seventeen, and where you are now, you feel you're you're on a more, um, more clearly defined trajectory towards yeah. the type of success yeah. you've discussed. Yeah, and undoubtedly, I mean, Rome was not built in a day, and it will always be. There will always be things to be done, always, um, and you know. We always have a, a joke around our partnership table that things never stay static. You might think, all right, okay, we've got over that, that jumped through that hoop or sorted out that problem. And then there's always something else. And I think it's learning to be comfortable with the There'll always be something else. There'll always be another challenge. There'll always be another opportunity um, as well. But yeah, I, I'm 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 proud of the of the firm and everything that we've done over the last six years. Um and you know, but there's still lots more to do. And that, that's what keeps it interesting. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you. For your time and best of luck in 2024. Thank you very much. So thanks very much for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying our content. We'd be delighted to hear any feedback that you have. You can find out more about the Your Law Firm Success podcast at mltdigital.co.uk forward slash podcast. Please subscribe, please share with your friends, please share with anyone who you know that you think would be interested.